Good morning, everybody. If we could have, go ahead and take your seats, uh, we'll go ahead and get this thing rocking and rolling. Uh, those of you that don't know me, my name is Bruce Spiker. I am the building official for the town of Kiwa Island. Uh, before we get started, we've got a few housekeeping duties to take care of. Uh, restrooms, men's restrooms right outside to my right here in the hall. Women's restroom is back in the lobby where you signed in at. Um, as far as breaks, uh, we'll try to take a break every hour for about 10 minutes. During the breaks, uh, it's been asked that we don't loiter around the swimming pool. Uh, the premise here is also a non-smoking, so uh, can't light up on the premise here. The other thing is all glassware has to stay within this room. Uh, that's pretty much it for housekeeping, I believe, and uh, this is being recorded. Uh, those individuals that were unable to attend will be able to see this on our website um, shortly after, uh, probably early next week sometime, I think. Chris is shaking his head yes, so I'm assuming it's okay. Um, there will also be a mic that's going to be passed around if you have any questions. Uh, anybody any questions and comments before we get rocking and rolling? No? Okay. It would help if I had my clicker. Amazing, but you can find our agenda for today. So, the first thing obviously, we'll be talking about some building department requirements when we start talking about installing um, post installed vertical rebar, uh, specifically epoxy rebar. Um, once I get done, we'll be taking lunch uh, for about 30 minutes, and then uh, Simpson Strong Tie engineers will be taking over. We have uh, Christopher Johnson uh, here, um, and also Chris Rooney. Uh, some of you may know him, I've had a few conversations with him in the past. He handles all the residential for the Low Country or up and down the Eastern Board? Uh, South Carolina. For South Carolina, okay. So, um, I know I've sent out quite a few emails in the past regarding the epoxy rebar. Uh, the reason for the emails is because I actually had three concerns dealing with uh, epoxy rebar systems. Those three concerns were number one, I wasn't sure that the engineer of the record was actually doing the calculations to uh, be able to identify what the embedment depth is. And the reason I say that is because I had similar footings and my embedment depths were kind of across the board. Um, so this class is going to be covering some of those calculations that need to be completed by the engineers and submitted to us for review. Um, if you are doing an epoxy system, uh, there's going to be quite a few requirements that you're going to have to meet to satisfy the building department. And I'll be covering those as well as uh, the Simpsons engineers. Um, my other concern was that for the installers, I didn't believe the installers were properly trained on the procedures for installing the epoxy rebar. And that was kind of obvious from some of the inspections we went on. Uh, obviously, there's given specific installation requirements based on whatever manufactured for the manufacturer there is for the epoxy rebar system. Um, those procedures need to be followed by the letter to ensure proper bonding of that epoxy rebar system. Uh, we'll be covering those aspects later on after lunch today. I don't want to steal the thunder from Simpson. Um, and there again, other manufacturers may have slightly different uh, installation requirements, but 
virtually they're going to be pretty close to the same thing. The only other concern I had dealing with epoxy rebar system was tensile strength. Um, and that was actually, um, I had a meeting uh, with the Simpson engineers, Chris Johnson being one of them, Kevin Davenport, um, and another Chris, a lot, lot of Chris's at Simpson. Chris Levine, Levine. Um, and they kind of walked me through one, the necessary installation steps, but we also covered um, pretty extensively how they test the epoxy rebar systems. And uh, I'll explain what I found out here in a minute. So, in looking at your footings, we now and should have probably in the past required that all your vertical rebar be supported prior to the pour. That is actually a requirement uh, out of the International Residential Code. And we got kind of lackadaisical with it. Not y'all, the building department did. Um, we now require that all your vertical rebar be supported. If it doesn't look similar to this picture, I can guarantee you it's going to fail. So you need to have it supported in some shape or form. doesn't have to necessarily be exactly like this, but we do want to see it at 90 degree angles and point straight up and support it somehow. Vertical rebar that is found to be outside the CMU block wall is no longer going to be acceptable. If you have this problem, you're going to cut the vertical rebar off and use an epoxy system. We cannot find anything unless there's some engineers in here can point me to somewhere else that said that had done any form of testing for vertical rebar that's outside the CMU block wall and then it's bent over to be placed within the cell that it should have been in to start with. Um, like I said, unless somebody can point me in the direction that I can see some test criteria of how this actually works, as it stands right now, this is a, a no longer an acceptable practice. As far as epoxy rebar systems, out of Chapter 19 in the International Building Code, we're going to require special inspections. Special inspections will be continuous. And what does that mean? It simply <laughs> means that that special inspector will be on site inspecting every piece of epoxy rebar that is to be placed. You will not leave the site until you are completed with that installation. Once he is satisfied with the installation, he will formulate a report, send it to the building department for review. And once that review is completed, you can move to the next phase of construction. Until that has been accepted by the building department, the job is at a standstill. So the special inspector, some of the things, this is not a comprehensive list, but it kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at. Obviously, he's going to identify the size of the rebar, the diameter of the drilled hole for the given size of the rebar, what cleaning operations were followed. He's going to identify the embedment depth. This is proper use of type of epoxy based on following the manufacturer's specifications where they follow. No drilling operations will take place until you reach your comprehensive strength for the concrete, usually around 28 days. He's also going to send us a report that identifies the spacing of the rebar, edge distances, and I've already talked about the manufacturer's specifications.
So to reiterate, misaligned rebar that is outside the CMU wall is no longer going to be acceptable practice. The engineer of record will submit to the building department before operations begin the calculations involved in identifying the embedment depth for the epoxy rebar system. We will require third party inspections, i.e. a special inspector. Special inspector is going to meet with the building department prior to going to the site and we are going to vet that special inspector. What we're requiring from the contractor is that the contractor submit to us the licensing uh, for that chosen individual as a special inspector, what his credentials are, and also to manufacture specifications for the system he's installing. And once we get through that, then the process can continue as far as going out to install the epoxy rebar. And this is whether you have installing one piece of epoxy rebar or whether you're doing numerous. Are there any questions for me before I... Yes, sir. Bruce, what is, what is the... Uh, what, what's required of your inspector? What, what licensing... We, so he obviously is going to be licensed as a special inspector through this LLR with the state. The licensing requirements has to be under masonry. Um, so long as he has that, we'll be fine. The other thing we want to meet with him, the reason we want to meet with him, to see how familiar he is with the epoxy rebar system. Has he inspected them before? Does he know what, what needs to be followed for the system? Um, to ensure bonding. You know, the, the whole purpose of this is to ensure that we're all on the same page, that we, at the end of the day, we have the, a basically a footing that is, needs structural integrity. Um, we don't want to obviously install something that will fail. Um, and this is to ensure that we don't, well, at least we hope nothing fails. There's always that outside chance, but uh, hopefully this will prevent that from happening. Um, yes, sir. Just a question on the last slide. It said you were going to add it. said concrete concrete for strength between the flooring and the main interior floor. So if we've already identified the offsite of this well, does that mean it's going to stay there for a lot of months before we can add the floor? You're specifications under ESR for Simpson, ESR being a evaluation report that is put out by ICC, International Code Council, which is the, obviously the ones that offer the code, uh, require 28 days. So yeah, it's going to sit for 28 days. 28 days from the time you pour it now, okay? Any other questions? Yes, sir. So, are we taking samples of the concrete to confirm what our compressive strength is? What we're looking at is your, um, you're going to have an invoice from your concrete supplier that states when you actually pour that concrete, and we'll utilize that to identify the 28 day. Because we can get breaks of three days, seven days. We don't, we don't need to go 20 days as long as we get your compressive strength that's required for the drawing. According to ECR, it's 28 days for this system. Other manufacturers may have other specific requirements, but according to the ECR, I read it was 28 days. Now, I understand what you're saying, but I'm just technically that's what they call it. Right, we poured a 5,000 psi slab last week, and we were at 5,000 psi in three days. So is it? Still want to wait for 28. I guess if we can provide proof that we're at that compressive strength before the 28 days. Uh, if you can provide some form of proof that it can be identified, then we probably could take a look at that. Okay. 
There was another question made in the back. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Special inspector is going to check embedding depth of all 100 holes. Yeah, he'll be on site basically checking embedment depth. He's going to be on site checking the procedures you follow for cleaning out the hole, brushing the hole, all those things are going to be checked by the special inspector while he's on site and you're forming the installation. Yes, sir. It was part of it. You know, I'll, I'll let you answer. I, that I do have a slide, and I got a slide or two, and we can kind of uh, make a discussion about it. We can we can bring out the slide now, or we just stay no, as long as we do it later and we follow through with that question. It's yeah, like it's, you know, absolutely, it's in there. I won't I won't pass over it. I mean, yeah. it's a very yeah. relevant subject, but it's a question that we get all the time. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, time is money, right? Content so. issues and other reasons and things that people didn't want to come to us from the from mm -hmm. the cell. Them strengths very early. Mm -hmm. but, you know, we don't have to put forth a yeah. thousand psi concrete. We can alter that tomorrow and be, you know, some of the mistakes we make that we can show them in the next one. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I was curious what you're asking. So you know. Yeah, so, so we'll dive into yeah, deeper great. detail with this, but yeah. uh, so uh, essentially we have done additional testing yeah. uh, to show what kind of capabilities are at an earlier date. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'll that's kind of step. I just don't want to miss that. Uh, the um, caveat is that there are additional testing outside of the code report. Um, so since the trunk tie was standard height, but um, it is not within the code report itself, um, it is up to the building official how they interpret it. Um, but it's kind of common sense. So yeah. uh, but I'll certainly lay out what we have um, in the field. And yeah. 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 All right, thank you. Um, any other questions? All right, we're doing a good, yep, go ahead. Edge distances, what do you mean by edge distances? How far in from the edge of the concrete wood? All right. That's what we're talking about for breakout and that kind of thing. The edge of the block. Yeah, yeah. The, anybody else? talking about edge distance and you just mentioned the CMU too that's the other thing too when you're talking about the center of the CMU if there was a tolerance that somebody said of three eighths of an inch we would know it's not going to happen in the next ten years but right. in the concrete. what is going to be your acceptance tolerance inside so, the CMU? So within the CMU yep. that rebar can be bent over so we're looking for center placement that's, that's what he was looking for. Okay at. so yeah it can be it can be bent as long as uh, we're inside with, the CMU. Within the CMU wall. Yep, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Outside the CMU wall? Yeah. No. Inside? Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Nope. All right. I'm going to. Sharon, are we ready for lunch back there? Yeah. Okay. Give us a few minutes to get the. Uh, Lunch staff back in here, and we'll go ahead and break for lunch for 30 minutes, and then we'll have Simpson come up and do a presentation. <laughs> Moving on schedule, and then keep uh, make sure everybody gets out of here at two, and uh, we kind of review everything. Uh, so I am Chris Johnson with uh, Simpson Strong Tie. Thank you for everyone uh, for coming in. Um, are we okay on the uh, the video? Am I okay to walk around to uh, keep things uh, lively? Um, real quick, uh, show of hands. Uh, how many contractors do we have um, in the in the crowd right now? So a good good amount, kind of uh, majority. What about engineers, structural engineers? 
Okay, we got a couple. Okay, and then uh, building officials. Okay, Any, anybody I left off that not there? Okay, okay. So with that said, some of this uh, this presentation is kind of wide ranging. Uh, there is uh, topics that may be of um, uh, more particular interest to engineers, and then it'll jump over to uh, topics that are more interest uh, for the contractors and, and uh, home builders that we have out here today. So I, um, you know, I will do my best uh, to keep everybody engaged, but uh, you know, I, I am not a. Uh, I'm not offended if uh, you feel that this uh, uh, particular portion of the presentation uh, is not um, something of uh, great interest uh, for you. But, but with that said, we're going to uh, kind of uh, essentially going to stick uh, and highlight the information that Bruce uh, laid out for us uh, during the start of the presentation there and, and keep it flowing. So um, let's get things kicked off. So real quick, just an uh, agenda uh, for what we're going to talk about. Um, Quick introduction, uh, then we're going to get into media things, uh, adhesive anchor overview, uh, just real broad, uh, general understanding of adhesive anchor so we all uh, kind of understand we're working off the uh, same ground uh, when it comes to uh, uh, understanding uh, anchors. Uh, then we'll jump over probably the, the most technical portion of the presentation, going over the design methods out there, so our anchor theory design and then also the rebar development length provision. Um, this is, uh, like I said, it's, it's the most technical, it's the most uh, engineering heavy um, subject to it. I will try to, uh, you know, judging by my numbers, um, there's only a particular portion of the crowd that is really going to dive into this. And plus, it's lunchtime, and I'm sure uh, after uh, um, eating that delicious barbecue, you're going to be a little sleepy. Then we'll jump over. Um, we'll do one quick design example uh, that will highlight both the uh, anchor theory and rebar development length provision. And kind of identify just uh, you know how how those uh, designs can be uh, performed, whether you're doing it on a computer or by hand or, or using the uh, charts associated with it. And then also, uh, you know, number six is essentially the second half of the presentation. There, um, it's, it's proper adhesive anchor installation, which I, I think a lot of people um, would, um, would be interested in. Um, so that's a, even though two through five here is a good amount. Number six is, is there's a lot of time to listen with that, and I'll, I'll make sure um, I'll make sure within this uh, uh, first period here before the break here, um, I'll, I'll make sure I get to that no, start of number six. So, with that said, uh, so Simpson Strong Tie. So, so quick plug, um, uh, keep the light. I know uh, this, this is a uh, presentation organized organized by the um, uh, town of Kiwa. Um, so I don't want to turn this into a, a commercial, but essentially Simpson Strong Tie, you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are already familiar with Simpson Strong Tie, but just with our wood connectors, our, our presence in the, in the wood side of the business. Um, we got that started in 1956, kind of an interesting story with the, the founder, Barkley Simpson. Um, he got a knock on the door from his neighbor, uh, essentially asking, uh, the neighbor was asking for a, a two by six uh, roof had a, a joist hanger. And so he, he said, yeah, I can absolutely do that. And that's kind of where the, the business started. Um, over the last 20 years, though, we've really worked hard to uh, expand that product offering outside of um, what everybody knows us for, for wood connectors. Um, we've gone into anchor systems. Uh, if you're looking at FRP concrete and CMU strengthening, uh, we've done a couple of uh, CMU strengthening projects um, in, in the Charleston area uh, where we apply this FRP, this carbon fiber material that, that's able to uh, increase the strength and stiffness of concrete and see new elements, uh, especially if uh, rebar is omitted uh, from the design. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, a common reason why people are bringing out FRP. Um, additionally, coal form steel connectors, um, if that, that comes up, we've, we've got a lot of um, kind of similar product lines that you would see on our wood connector line, but also on the CFS, and also a lot of unique shapes associated with that too. And then lastly, um, I think is, is relevant um, to this kind of region, uh, especially as our, our yield link. Um, it, what it is, it's an all bolted, field bolted moment connection. I got the, the heavy duty sample, miniature sample uh, in the back of the office there, um, back of the room there. Uh, it's pre-qualified for high seismic uh, regions, which you know, Charleston is a high seismic region. So 
Um, especially if, if you're looking at a uh, house that has one of these uh, gigantic uh, windows, uh, sliding glass windows uh, for their great uh, beach view. Uh, a lot of times that framing is accomplished through a moment frame. And this is a, uh, this is a great uh, particular application or solution for that application. We, do, we actually, um, uh, if uh, anybody has seen the top off going up um, over by the airport there, um, we do have our connection, this yield link moment connection uh, going on in that building. So feel free to ask me, uh, myself, uh, Chris Freeman, um, any, any, any of us uh, about these uh, uh, kind of additional product line stuff. So real quick, yeah, I, I'm Chris Johnson, back of the room there, Chris Rooney. Um, I am the field engineer covering North Carolina and South Carolina. Uh, my territory is a little bit bigger. Whereas uh, Chris is, is kind of centralized to uh, Charleston, he's a, he's a local Charleston. Uh, a local Charlestonian, um, and I think your territory kind of caps out at upstate um, South Carolina. Um, yeah, so Chris is a great resource for you know having someone immediately on the ground um, nearby, and then also uh, uh, sneaking in for the food there. Um, uh, our other colleague Zach Thick right there, uh, another uh, kind of anchor concrete specialist. Uh, uh, up until very recently, uh, jumped over on internal training department. So uh, you, you might uh, recognize Zach from his uh, years of service, uh, service in this region too. And it, this, so this isn't a map of all our projects. This is a map of all the field support and engineer, engineering support that we have uh, all across the country right there. So even if you get a, a project outside of this region, uh, we, we likely have someone very close by. All right, so we did meet, mention the continuing education. Uh, it's a PDH. It's not AIA approved for uh, if there's any architects in the crowd there. Um, I, I will, I'll get everybody's emails, and I'll, I'll plug those in. And if, if you need them, um, uh, this, uh, you should be receiving this kind of generic email just from training at strongtie.com. Um, so if you need this, uh, just be on the lookout for that. It sometimes gets stuck in the junk email folder. Uh, one of the benefits, though, of this is this gives you access, uh, well, it, it, it's not hard to get access, but this gives you a, a direct link to access our other online training. Uh, there is a lot of training, uh, not just specific for engineers, but specific for contractors, um, dealing with a lot of our, our different product lines that, that, that are uh, very useful and can be kind of taken 24-7. Um, you know, all right, so the adhesive anchor overview. So what is adhesive anchor? So how do we get from what you buy at the store, this cartridge right here, to uh, what you see right here of uh, a thread rod being uh, embedded into uh, that concrete right there? And this is a thread rod. So this is actually a testing sample. I don't know if anybody knows uh, that uh, the, the net thickness of that third rod is starting to stretch out. So we've actually applied a tension load to that one and started elongating uh, that thread rod. Uh, so what is it also commonly called? Um, I, I'm sure you've heard uh, these other terms. Uh, you know, Simpson, we, we kind of stick to this term, a his, a, adhesive anchor. Um, I'm sure you've heard epoxy anchor, chemical anchors is a, is a pretty popular one. Uh, bonded anchors, adhesive bonded anchors. Um, one thing this, this is not is, uh, grouted, uh, grouted, uh, cementitious grouted anchor. It's, a, it's definitely two different anchors that we're talking about, or two different systems that we're talking about there. Um, but that's uh, essentially what we're going to talk about today. And this is a, a good point to kind of th throw out a disclaimer. You know, I'm, I'm referring to it as adhesive anchors. Um, that's what Simpson Strong Tie does. That's what a lot of other manufacturers do, but um, each manufacturer is unique. And I, I try to keep this presentation as general as possible, but there's inherently there's just going to be points where I'm kind of Hit hammering on uh, something that is a little bit more unique to uh, Simpson Strong Tie. So, just to, you know, that you may come across after you leave this uh, presentation and find that a different manufacturer uh, comes at it a little bit differently. So, just disclaimer this, uh, I'll try to keep it as general as possible, but there will be times where we're a little bit product specific. All right, so how do adhesive bankers actually work? Um, it, two, two kind of mechanisms. Um, to essentially deliver that strength. Um, uh, you're looking at a cohesive strength of the adhesive element, so the actual uh, the epoxy or adhesive actually bonds to that substrate, which right here, picture here, 
of uh, concrete uh, cut out right there. It, you actually get a chemical uh, uh, lock right there. And then also the interlock ability, more of a mechanical interlock uh, because you got a little bit of the surface of that concrete is a little, uh, it's not exactly smooth. Um, there is roughness associated with that. So that adhesive fits into those um, that small imperfections of the, of the wall there and just provides a, a mechanical interlock. And, and a little bit more, a little bit more apparent right there is what you see with the threaded rod and the threads and that adhesive being able to fit around those uh, threaded rods. So that's really that locking mechanism going on right there. Now, he's an anchor is a two part chemical system. So uh, we have this, once again, is a little bit product specific or manufacturer specific. So Simpson has uh, two different systems. We have an epoxy system and an acrylic system. And within those, uh, it's similar. It's a two-part system, part A and part B. So we got a resin and a hardener. And then over for the acrylic, similar deal, a resin and initiator. Uh, once those two uh, particular products are, are mixed and combined, that's whenever you get that chemical reaction occurring. Um, so, you know, back here, real apparent, right? This uh, 56 fluid ounce, um, so that's a, that's a lot of adhesive, right? Uh, you can see the part A and part B. Um, and even with here, a little bit different ratio, right? One to one ratio here, equal parts A, equal parts B. Over here, 10 to one ratio, much larger resin re reservoir and smaller initiator. But we do, you know, our most popular product that gets sold is, is the smaller cartridge sizes. Um, so that looks like a single cartridge, right? So what is what is actually going on? Um, if you flip that and set it 3G uh, around on the bottom there, you can see what is actually going on is, is two separate canisters, uh, two separate cartridges lined up right there. Um, so we still have that resin and hardener right there. Um, just something you know easily can be overlooked and, and a little confusing if, if you're buying the same product. Uh, it's the same same chemical mixture, um, same ratio associated with that. Uh, same deal if, if I uh, showed you the, the, the bottom of the ATXP. ATXP is a little bit harder to see just because of that 10 to 1 ratio there. Um, and, and also it's, it's black, so it does not stand out quite as well as the Step 3G. Okay, so you know, once we need those two chemicals to come in contact and, and mix together and initiate that uh, kind of chemical response. Occur. And then once that chemical response actually starts to occur, you know, it's, a, it's an exothermic reaction. So it's, you know, if you've ever uh, put your hand on a nozzle here, um, you're going to tell it's a little bit warmer. So that's an you know, indication that that chemical reaction is, is occurring and uh, you get some heat off of that. Um, so within that mixing nozzle um, for this ATXP that gets screwed directly on top right there, um, you can see the two parts kind of coming out and you can trying to show with this picture is, is just the, the color change uh, that occurs that uh, you know you predominantly see the uh, that tin part of uh, this mixture and then once it starts mixing with the other um, uh, other uh, initiator there you can see that the, the color starts to change and and also you can see right here pretty clear delineation between that resin and the initiator right there um, that the white uh, material uh, right in the middle so, so once once mixed and, and put down into um, a, a drilled out hole, and uh, it, you come back with a, either a threaded rod or a piece of rebar. Uh, rebar very similar properties associated with that. Um, that you're just putting it down in there. There's uh, deformations on a piece of rebar. The the, the bumps um, on that rebar that is uh, operating the same kind of mechanical interlock. Um, properties that you would see with uh, the thread rods associated with that. So you said it, you, you let it cure, um, basically you let that chemical uh, process uh, to, you know, to occur, and it, it comes to that hardened state and essentially delivers the properties that we've uh, tested and, and we publicized uh, that we'll be able to achieve. All right, so where, where do adhesive anchors, are, are they utilized? Uh, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, residential, um, application. So I got a post base right here, um, but a lot of times whenever uh, uh, a, a, 
Dow for a senior wall is uh, misplaced or, or ran over. I, I've seen that um, happen uh, a lot of times where uh, pieces just knock right off. Um, a lot of uh, residential applications associated with that. Same thing with the uh, commercial anchors. Um, just uh, it's a lot of same applications, just uh, different, uh, maybe heavier materials if you, if you start jumping into the structural steel game. And then also industrial. Um, you know, heavy industrial, you're going to see a lot with uh, commercial excuse me, DOT projects. Um, you see a lot of adhesive uh, being utilized in, in that um, that market. Uh, anytime they're joining two um, uh, concrete pours and they got a lot of dowels extending one way or another. So a lot of, a lot of adhesive being utilized in, in a variety of different markets. Right, so what are the advantages? Why, why do we like uh, adhesive anchors? One, you can get very high tension and, and, and shear load out of those uh, adhesive anchors, out of those dowels. So um, if, if you're designing and you're looking to achieve, a, um, you, know, you have to hit a very high uh, load mark, um, you're likely jumping up to adhesive anchor compared to you know, uh, some of the mechanical anchors. Um, I got a, a screw anchor right here. Um, adhesive anchors can greatly exceed the load that you can achieve out of a, a screw anchor or a wedge anchor or expansion anchor, something like that. So high load that. So sometimes you just need that adhesive anchor. Uh, you can also get those very high loads with shallow embedments um, if designed uh, appropriately. Uh, you can achieve um, some pretty good loads at, like I said, shallow thin members. Uh, small anchor spacing and short edge distances. Um, so for our adhesives, I said. As it stands right now, we got another adhesive coming down the line that will kind of mess with this a little bit. But as it stands right now, uh, the minimum edge distance. Now, this minimum edge distance is there's a caveat or disclaimer on that minimum edge distance. You can get all the way down to one and three quarters inch from the center of the anchor to the edge of the concrete. Now, that doesn't mean that edge distance right there. If you were to put that same anchor in the middle of the slab, you're going to get a lot more capacity out of that anchor in the middle slab. But as long as uh, the engineer, uh, the structural engineer that you're working with, um, says that that location is okay, you can go to that. So um, why do we have inch and three quarters? Uh, if you take a two by four and you're putting uh, a, a seal plate uh, anchor on right in the middle of it, that's the dimension that you're going to get. So that's why we test all the way to inch and three quarters. Likewise with the spacing, uh, you can actually get pretty tight spacing associated with this. Now, the tighter the spacing you go, the less strength you will get, but we can install and we can get loads at a spacing and it's all the way down to three inches on center spacing. Um, so you can get a pretty pretty hefty uh, cluster of, uh, of dowels um, put into one place in a tight cluster, but uh, close to the edge. Now, it doesn't mean that's going to be the strongest thing and, and likely your concrete is going to be your failure mechanism, but the point is that you can, you can do it. Precise location of anchors. Um, this is pretty apparent with the conversation we uh, had a little bit earlier. If uh, a rebar dowel is misplaced outside of the wall, um, you know for a fact that it's fairly easy um, to, to achieve that location uh, for that adhesive dowel in the middle of the wall. What kind of base materials can you utilize adhesive anchors for? Um, concrete, normal weight concrete, lightweight concrete. Uh, a lot of times I see lightweight concrete on uh, Slab on decks, if you're uh, seeing like a, a commercial building, of course, you know, some houses, uh, I'm sure some high-end residential may jump to a, a concrete surface, but that's where they utilize lightweight concrete just to save on some uh, material weight and uh, just kind of skinny up the building. Hollow and grout filled CMU, uh, concrete masonry, and then also brick, unreinforced brick. And not all, not all adhesives are approved for all these, but we do have an adhesive that at least checks one of those box, boxes. All right, jumping over to the design method. Now, I will try to keep this um, somewhat at a high level and uh, not get too far into the weeds because, well, uh, honestly, I don't even like getting into the, the equations uh, <laughs> too deeply, um, kind of reason. Uh, so prior to joining Simpson, uh, which I've been with Simpson for about three years, I was a practice structural engineer. And uh, one of the reasons I, I kind of came over here was to kind of avoid doing those uh, daily calculations. But what we're going to talk about 
And the first one is, is what's called the anchor theory. And uh, there's essentially two prevailing methods uh, for designing adhesive anchors. The anchor theory and the rebar development length revision. Now anchor theory, I say it's the traditional method of anchor design. Um, more so it's just the uh, more commonly accepted and more commonly used uh, form of anchor design. It's been around, uh, the, at least the methodology has been around a lot, lot more, a lot longer uh, compared to the rebar development length provision. Um, so when did it first kind of come out? When did it first appear into codes? Um, that would be you know, enforced by uh, building officials and, and need to be followed by structural engineers. In uh, 2002, under the ACI, American Concrete Institute, 318. That 318 is um, one of the first, I, I'm sure a lot of people have heard that that particular code, ACI 318, because it, it's just uh, very valuable and a, and a wealth of information when it comes to designing anything in concrete, you're likely going to start at that ACI 318. So that anchor theory uh, first appeared in that uh, 318.02, so back in all the way in 2002. So it's been around for about 20 years. So, uh, you know, one thing about engineering, specifically in the construction industry, it takes a while for new methods and, and new technologies to kind, of, kind of come into play and actually implement it. Um, so this has been around long enough that even uh, some of the uh, uh, more seasoned engineers that they're well aware of uh, this de design anchor theory and uh, actually in implementing it and, and putting it into their uh, daily practice. So when's the first time adhesive, the, the term adhesive anchors showed up in ACI? It wasn't until a ACI 318.11, which would be 2011, um, that adhesive anchors kind of popped in. Uh, prior to that, it, it was basically, well, you have to do a little bit of gymnastics to uh, justify using the ACI 318 for adhesive anchors. And then once 2011 rolled around, it was a lot easier. It was just included in the code. All right, so, you know, I mentioned ACI. Uh, I'm sure everybody's aware of the building code. Um, and these two work in tandem. Uh, a lot of times the building code references ACI 318, like I, like I showed right here under the South Carolina building code. Um, so essentially, it, it's pretty direct, right? South Carolina Building Code says if you're going to be anchoring to concrete, uh, so anchoring is, is, is threaded rods, or it could be cast in place options too, right? Uh, cast in place is, is definitely covered within this ACI 318. Uh, they're saying that you've got to utilize ACI 318 for that design. Of it. There's, there's really no wiggle room outside of that if, if you're anchoring. And then also 318 is, is pretty specific in their language too. Basically, hey, this chapter, this chapter 17, covers anchoring into concrete for structural applications. Uh, so anytime you're dealing with the structural applications, if you're doing a CMU wall, if you're doing a floor slab or a foundation, um, if you're going into a, a pier or a column, you got to be going by the rules that are laid out uh, within a, uh, the 318. And just kind of give it away, but... Uh, I'll, I'll hold off, but uh, just take note that 21 days, 21 days is actually referenced in uh, ACI 318. I get, I get myself, uh, to be honest, I, I didn't say anything earlier because I get myself uh, confused and I didn't want to say something without it. But um, so, so 21 days is that minimum. But we'll we'll circle back to that. All right. So what about the residential code, right? So a lot of times, um, if you're doing a house, you're not even concerned about the IBC. You're, you're looking at the residential code. Uh, residential code is a little bit different. Uh, they basically say, they, you know, the word adhesive um, as related to adhesive anchors, the, the word adhesive is actually in the IRC, but as far as related to adhesive anchors, uh, it, it's not in there. What they do is they essentially say, hey, for, you know, we are aware that there's other technologies out there um, that um, have uh, peeled away from, uh, you know, what do they say, traditional um, construction or, um, uh, yeah, that's something along those lines. And they say, you know, it, we're aware of it, and, and we accept those, provided that uh, that uh, new technology is accepted, and, and there's evaluation reports, and there's testing associated with it, and then it's also accepted by the building official right here. So, uh, pretty 
pretty generic language, but that's essentially how you can justify using adhesive anchors uh, within the, the residential IRC code right there, um, alternative building products. So as long as we can ensure we and in the industry of any type of uh, um, any kind of alternative building product can ensure that that uh, innovative and efficient product uh, is kind of in um, is uh, is uh, purposely kind of serving that same purpose. Um, then you know it's accepted uh, engineering practice. So how do we get to that point of actually accepting it? Because uh, because anybody can kind of come up with the idea and then just kind of sell it off the, off the back of their truck or something like that. Um, how how do we uh, you know? make these solutions legitimate and show that they stand up to uh, uh, kind of our general engineering practice. So we look at evaluation reports. Um, and those evaluation reports uh, kind of put these products through the, uh, the blender of the test, uh, kind of the, uh, the gauntlet, if you will, of, of different tests to ensure that they're going to behave and perform as advertised. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people have heard of evaluation reports or uh, Called, commonly called code reports um, uh, out there. What you see is uh, two pretty popular uh, companies that run these evaluation reports. Uh, the ICC, Evaluation Service, ES, and then also you're going to come across a lot this uh, IPNO. Uh, I think uh, maybe incorrect, but it's like Inter uh, International Association of Plumbers and Mechanical Operators. Uh, kind of interesting they got into this Evaluation game, but uh, nonetheless, um, they are companies. You know, they're functioning for profit. Um, sometimes you see that ICC, uh, and you kind of also notice that they're the ones that are in charge of the building code. Uh, this arm of it is, is definitely working for profit, and they and they charge charge um, uh, a, a good amount to basically put these evaluation reports together for the companies that do get them. And, and what you'll find is uh, at Simpson Strong Tie. Um, but specifically for our anchoring products, um, these are the two code agencies that we run through, uh, ICC and IPNO. And you will find that across the board for manufacturers. You might some, find some manufacturers that rely, rely a little bit more heavily on IPMO, um, some that uh, rely a little bit more on ICC. Uh, but as far as the anchoring world goes, um, these are the two popular ones that you'll see. Um, if you kind of jump out, like if you jump to our, our wood connector route, um, we do kind of stick to these same two for the wood connector, but if you look at other manufacturers, you might find uh, some other uh, agencies out there uh, kind of playing in that space. Just so, just a, just an FYI, if you, if you see a, a code report that looks a little bit different, it's, it's because it's a, just another uh, agency putting it together. All right, so this is the report. Now, what about the test? What about the gauntlet of tests? Um, who establishes that? That would be the acceptance criteria, which, you know, lo and behold, who is in charge of this uh, particular acceptance criteria for adhesive anchors? It's uh, the ICC. So they're, uh, they're kind of um, in a lot of spots, right? Um, but the acceptance criteria lays out all the testing that is required um, for you to submit uh, a particular product, you being the manufacturer, for me to submit. And you can see this is just a, a snippet of the test that we had to put uh, set 3G through um, to get that, uh, to basically show that it performs like it does. And then we take all those test results and then submit it back through ICC to get, go back, to get that evaluation report. Um, so, you know, working in hand-in-hand, -hand, but, uh, but essentially two specific different processes and, and two specific different uh, reports um, associated with that. So this, this costs a lot. Um, Simpson as a company, I know we spend north of $10 million uh, when you start looking at all our uh, testing that we do and all the uh, acceptance criteria, $10 million per year. Um, so it, this uh, certainly isn't cheap, and, and if, if you ever uh, kind of ask the question, like, why didn't you test for that? It's like, well, you know, we, got, we, we kind of ran out of budget money on that particular application. So um, that, that is, uh, can sometimes be the answer. Um, but uh, we do have uh, a good amount of testing and, and uh, kind of backup uh, to show that the, the product does perform like we expect it to. So jumping over back over to the anchor theory. Uh, so how do the engineers actually 
uh, design these? Uh, how would they, where would they start, essentially, right? Uh, if they're uh, starting from scratch and, and they need to, they know what kind of forces, uh, let's say they're designing a hold down. Um, they know that they got a tremendous amount of wind load coming down on this uh, particular uh, post and, and hold down, and they're gonna have a, a very high tension load coming up. Um, where do they start? Uh, they start at the ACI 318. Uh, specifically, this chapter 17, anchoring the concrete, and they're going to look at uh, the, all the requirements, all the failure modes, if you will, um, that could occur. And, and right over here is a good image that ACI puts together of all the different failure modes that you need to consider. Um, now, some are specific to the product. Like if you look right here, you can see bond failure. It's kind of hard to see, but you can kind of see that anchor. Um, almost, almost looks like a, uh, a dip pop, uh, something to that extent, but you can see that's the adhesive anchor. And that specific bond failure is uh, unique to adhesive anchors, um, similar to, to the pull out right there. That's uh, kind of unique to wedge anchors or screw anchors, um, whereas some of these are more general. Uh, that concrete breakout right there, which is you know, probably governs 80% of the designs out there. That concrete breakout needs to be checked for cast in place anchors, but it also needs to be checked for adhesive anchors and also mechanical anchors. Um, then saying, you know, I'm covering a lot of tension loads. Like, what is tension? It's when you're pulling up, right? I, I said the hold down. If the wind's blowing on the building during a hurricane, we want to make sure that the, the house uh, stays put and, and doesn't uh, jump up and flip over. Uh, shear loads, a little bit different, a little bit different load associated with it. You can kind of see the direction of that force right there, that V, that's that shear load. It's not up like the tension, it's, it's over like the shear. But similar failure modes that we need to check. And what you're doing is, as, a, as an engineer or designer, you're looking and you're trying to find that, that weakest link right there. Um, so what is my controlling failure mechanism? Um, what can I expect that failure mechanism to be, the value of it? And then I need to put a reduction on that so I know that I'm not coming right there to the threshold and, and leaving no room for any type of uh, uh, tolerance or, or margin right there and then design appropriately for that. So, and, and when I said a fee factor, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the safety factor. Um, if, you, if you open one of our catalogs on the back there, for, as far as the, the wood catalogs, you would see that we have a safety factor um, associated with it. Now, if you look in the anchor uh, catalog, specifically the products that are being designed Within ACI, you, you won't see a safety factor. It's like, well, where to go? Um, it's in a way, it's being applied by uh, throwing a, a reduction factor um, to those loads. So just a very general description of, of what's going on there as far as uh, trying to uh, account for those safety factors. All right, so within that chapter 17, right, and within the particular section, there is very lengthy calculations that are required. Um, a lot of Greek symbols that I don't know the name, uh, a lot of these uh, particular symbols, but you have to go into the, to the uh, design manual there and, and, and take a look. Um, a lot of these symbols are related to how close to the edge is it? Uh, what kind of existing reinforcing is in the concrete uh, currently? Um, what temperature um, is the concrete material? This all plays a factor and the strength that you can get out of the particular design. And this is just a snippet, so five and six. So there's a lot more checks associated with them, and, and each one has about the same amount of uh, length um, as far as the equation length associated with it. And every time you move it or change something, or if you go down that uh, kind of rabbit hole and design it and find, oh, like this number, this number four rebar doesn't work, like what about number six? You got to go back in, and there's there's a couple things that you kind of kind of repeat, but a lot of things change when you go back in there. So um, it is definitely one of the more time-consuming and cumbersome uh, ways of going about design. If you if you were to do it, uh, you know, uh, pen and paper, um, of the old school route. Um, and and really, I say old school, but 30 years ago nobody was doing this because this is somewhat recent um, uh, requirements associated with the code. Um, so there, there's kind of, it's no surprise that these very lengthy checks um, kind of came into play with also the more uh, essentially uh, computer usage, right? We, there's a faster way of doing it. We can be more specific now. We can be very exact with all these factors here and come up with a, a very specific design, but we can, it's going to take a whole lot longer. 
So fortunately, there's design aids out there, right? Uh, there's a couple of different options. Um, you can get very specific with our anchor designer software. Uh, we're not unique. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers have uh, other softwares. Now, for, for my money, some manufacturers uh, charge for ours. We don't. Ours is uh, free to, directly to download from the website right there. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very good uh, software. We recently, uh, quote, unquote, uh, updated it. Um, and then also, we have other options, too. Uh, post a foundation designer. And let, me, let me get into that a little specific. Each one uh, does a similar application, but are a little bit better suited for, for different applications. So the anchor designer. Like I said, you can get a very specific unit. You're doing the, the code design by the T right here. Um, you can, there's a lot of uh, freedom and customization associated with uh, what you can design within the software. Uh, essentially, very little is, is off the books for uh, being able to design within here. Um, and then once you go through here and go through the somewhat relatively easy uh, layout and, and select the variables and that are specific to your job, you'll get a printout. And I think, uh, you know, as Bruce uh, mentioned at the start, you know, engineers are required to submit uh, their calculations for uh, these uh, particular uh, anchor design. This automatically puts all that information in there, and it's very, uh, it, 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 it's laid out. Um, what you will find, some engineering softwares are, are somewhat black box in that they'll tell you, hey, this is good, but they won't give you the, the finer details of line by line why it's good. This lists every finer detail, and it also tells you, oh, by the way, you can find the, this particular code uh, in, under this page in this section of that ACI. So, uh, very good option if uh, you're having to submit uh, calculations. You know, you can print it to PDF and save it and keep it stored away. Other option, not as, definitely not as customizable, right? Um, but maybe better suited for those design post uh, kind of hold down applications. So the, the more run of the mill kind of typical uh, designs. Uh, so if you were having to design a, a hold down or a clip, um, you could also design that anchorage associated with it too. Um, so similar similar deal. You, you go through here and you, you click uh, click on your unique conditions for the job. Now, uh, so user tip: if if you do have to use this particular one. I try to use it on my small laptop screen, as you see right there, and it does not, it doesn't do it justice. There's a lot of scrolling around, so if you, if you do utilize this software, which is free on our website, you just go on the website, click the uh, icon, and, and it pops up immediately for you. Um, it'd be nice to have a, a larger monitor there, so you can just scroll down. Um, once again, you do get calculation printouts associated with that, so if, if you're out or having to submit anything, you can find it there too. And then last but not least, you know, you, you'll get people say, you know, I, I, I used the tables 10 years ago. What did, what did you do to these tables? Well, we still have the tables. Um, so with each progressive step, we've gotten a little bit more, uh, not generic, but uh, more conservative in our design approach. Um, whereas Anchor Designer, very specific, going to give you the, the you know, sharpest calculation possible. Um, with each step here, we're making some conservative assumptions that are going to kind of open up that range of uh, available solutions right there. So maybe not the most cost efficient means. Maybe it's a, it's a little bit more uh, heavy handed approach associated with it. But sometimes, you know, it's a lot quicker just to get uh, a particular answer. And if, and if you're talking, you know, two inches of uh, embedment difference, and maybe that's not that big of a deal for, for two thousand. More so, time is of the effort. So, so we do have these technical engineering bulletins. Like I said, there's a there's a whole list of assumptions um, that we that we put into these to be able to put these tables together. But we do have those loads, and it's kind of I should have highlighted right here. But they are allowable loads, whereas all the uh, the numbers before, specifically the anchor designer, uh, was a, a strength uh, kind of a uh, low combo uh, up factored uh, strength design LRD. I associate with that. So this is a little bit more similar to what, uh, if anybody's had to do this in the past 20 years and, and looked into a code uh, or looked into a table to, to pull a value, you, you're going to be very familiar with the allowable loads um, that we publish here. And these are on our website, and they're specific to the product. So you can see right here, 
I got set 3G. We have uh, data for set XP. We have it for uh, AD XP also. Um, we even have it for our mechanical anchors too. So the screw anchors, uh, like the Titan HD, and the Stromboll too. All right, so even with all that design and all that capability, there are just inherent limitations uh, to design those adhesive anchors specific within that anchor theory. Um, you are limited to 20 times, so for the embedment depth, which probably doesn't come up too often on residential that you're, you're bumping into the uh, maximum embedment, but you are limited 20 times the diameter. And you can see that pretty clearly, so if we jump to a number eight bar, which also has a one inch diameter, one times 20 is 20. So you can see that right away. And if you go across the line there and just multiply by the appropriate factor, you, you can see that, that 20 times diameter. Um, that 20 times diameter is, is set forth in, in the code there. Yeah, Bruce. And doing the calculations for embedment depth, um, hypothetically, let's say I have a standard 12 inch footing, however, my calculations are showing 14 inch embedment depth for a certain spacing, let's just call the spacing 48 inches on the center. If I move the spacing closer together, 32 inches, what, what happens? Is that going to change my calculation? to the point where I can have less of an embedment depth? It's it, it may, it may. It, each uh, each uh, situation is, is unique, but it, it absolutely may by, you know, kind of uh, decreasing. Um, essentially, you're adding anchorage, right? Uh, so in, in a form, you're kind of throwing more anchors to be able to resist uh, possibly that same force. So if you're, if you're taking where you were trying to resist 10,000 pounds with one anchor, and now you're resistant with uh, closer to two anchors, then yeah, absolutely, that would have an impact on your on your spacing. Now that, each situation is unique. Certainly if you started pushing those anchors closer and closer together, and you were getting closer to like 12 to eight inches, um, you get some overlapping effect going on right there, and you actually get the inverse uh, going on, where by putting it a little bit closer, you're actually making the, the thing weaker. Um, and you know that that's what one of the benefits if I jump back to anchor designer you can play around with it you can see oh if I if I change this number to six oh it's actually it's actually weaker even though I have an extra anchor in there um, so it's it's kind of interesting how that uh, kind of would play out yes when you're stating weaker you're talking about the concrete itself like spacing uh, is tighter together when I say well I, I mean the the ultimate load that number you're looking at the so the uh, question was like, all right, am I talking about the concrete being weaker? I mean, the concrete is the same strength, right? It's, it's 4,000 bits. Yeah. If you're bringing the bars in tighter, we're yeah. coming up with the weakness. Yeah. Uh, essentially, I'll, I mean, okay. Right here. That concrete break outcome? That's what I'm talking about. That shape right there, I believe it's 35 degrees. Yeah. It's always 35 degrees. Now, if you push these two anchors closer together, Carry that shaded area, and the two start to overlap. That's the concrete issue. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the phenomenon or effect that you kind of you're absolutely hitting that on. Um, so uh, is the concrete weaker? I don't know. Building anchor itself is when you build it, you fix the anchor. You're trying to make me do this. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's what I was getting at. Was yes. you're basically the closer you get together when you do get the pull out of the breakout or whatever. It's a concrete issue more than a than the actual adhesive or the bar itself. Correct. That's Correct. what I was trying to state. Yes. Yes, that, that is a that is a true state. That is a true state. And it's just something to keep in mind as a contractor. You know, a lot of times you're like, well, can't we just throw two anchors at it? Like, well, not really, because you know, we're, we're already too tight and too close together as it is. Um yeah, but like I said, that concrete breakout failure, that kind of gray cone. That's a, that controls a lot of your designs, and a lot of times that is uh, kind of uh, the, the head scratcher, if you will, for the engineer to try to figure it out. So, if they do run into that situation, there is kind of keep this in your back pocket. Alternative design approach: rebar development length revision. Now that the kind of the origin, the, the creation of this, um, 
I started back in from testing back in 2003. Uh, some professors at University of Florida um, did some uh, associated testing with the Florida DOT, um, and where they looked at, you know, they're looking at these uh, large bridge decks and uh, looking at uh, the need to embed things rebar at a, a, a hefty amount, a, a deep, uh, deep embedment associated with that. But they were running into the case where you were kind of bumping up against a concrete breakdown. You're like, well, if I if I embed this, you know, 30 inches, um, I I got to believe that I'm going to get a better uh, number than a concrete breakout that might be like associated with a six inch embedment. So they went through testing and um, they were able to kind of prove or, or at least show that those uh, deep embedments of that uh, reinfor reinforcing bars. Uh, for post install for adhesive anchorage, uh, performed in the, or behaved in the structurally similar ways as a cast in place option being developed into. Uh, so it, it eventually it was adopted in that same acceptance criteria that I was mentioning earlier. And so, what am I talking about with uh, development of rebar? So, a lot of times, if you're doing cast in place rebar and you're having to develop it between a uh, existing or poor that is uh, getting uh, put up against a, a coal joint, essentially, or a construction joint, right? There's only so many trucks that you can bring out to the site to be able to pour that long, continuous run of a, a footing. Um, and, and at some point, at the end of the day, you just got to call it quits and come at it the next day. So how do you how do you join those two coal joints, right? You got to run the rebar through, right? You got to run the rebar through that joint. Um, and essentially, you want to make sure that rebar. Do we want that rebar? Kind of sticking in uh, two inches of the concrete. No, we want to make sure that it's it's, it's fully developed into that uh, existing concrete member, so we know that once it, it's pulled on, it's not just going to pop out on you. I mean, this that technology right there has been around for forever, right? Since uh, I, I was uh, googling when the first ACI came out this morning, it was in 1967. But there was uh, previous codes uh, or kind of guidance, if you will, all the way back in 1945, I think it was. So. This technology and this kind of uh, mechanism and way of construction has been around forever. Um, what has not been around forever is kind of the doing the same type of approach for rebar. I'm no longer talking about anchor rods. We're not talking about thread anchor rods anymore. We're only talking about rebar. That kind of same concept and idea is relatively new uh, when uh, using a heat anchor for it. So within that AC 308, the same AC308 that we put, you know, uh, our adhesive testing through. Um, additionally, jumping down, there's another table with an equally lengthy amount of tests that um, that need to uh, be run uh, to show that your adhesive is approved for this uh, rebar development like for vivid. And uh, essentially, where I was talking about earlier, uh, the limitation uh, earlier was 20 times an embedment depth with this. Post installed rebar, it's uh, 60 times the rebar embedment. So that's a that's a significant uh, depth that you can achieve. I mean, think the number eight can get all the way to 60 inches. I'd, uh, it'd be uh, quite the workout um, or a long day if you had to drill a 60 inch hole um, uh, out there. So yeah, installation at deep embedment. So that is, that is one thing to make sure that it's possible that that test needs to occur at 60 times that diameter right there. Because um, you're also, you know, you're putting a lot of heat down in that hole, so you, you want to make sure that that can actually occur, that it's actually, you know, uh, workable and, and doable. All right, 12 for getting, so I think I'm coming up pretty close here, so I should be able to hit it, and we can take a 10 minute break, and then we'll get into the good stuff with the anchor and install. Not all adhesives are created equal, and not all adhesives have this rebar belt like provision approval. Um, set 3G, set XT are two epoxies. They do. They're good for the traditional method, and they're good for the new uh, re, uh, rebar development, RDLP. ATXP, uh, no. Um, so ATXP, and I'm going to uh, kind of continue on this a little bit later on, but essentially ATXP is our fast curing. Um, it hardens a lot quicker than the epoxies do. Um, so imagine if you're trying to put this ATXP down a 60-inch hole, there's a good chance by the time you get uh, to the top um, with filling that uh, uh, adhesive in, that the bottom of it is already hardened, and by the time you bring that rebar to try to put it down, it's just going to be, you know, you're not 
going to get it, uh, any of it down in there. So that's one of the that's one of the reasons ATXP just is not um, appropriate for this application. Also, you know, I always I find it pretty interesting that you want something that adhesive that is uh, I think uh, uh, yeah adhesive that is too stiff may kind of exhibit uh, debonding of the uh, of the uh, adhesive to concrete. So if you got a, a long embedment like 30 inch embedment and the adhesive is actually too stiff, that actually works against it. Uh, reminds me of like a Ray Allen, I don't know why I remember this, there's some uh, playoff game where after the game he's talking about his defense uh, bending but not breaking. So that kind of um, that, that comes to mind whenever I see that. So we want an adhesive that can, can get a little bit, um, but not too stiff, but, uh, but also be strong enough to be able to develop that rebar to where if you pull on it, it's the rebar that's going to be failing and it's not going to be the uh, adhesive failing. Kind of fine line you got to uh, cross there. So how do you design it? Um, this one's a little bit straightforward. Um, it goes back to, like I said, this technology of developing has, has been around since the 40s, 60s. Um, these equations have been around forever. It's the same equations that you would utilize for a uh, cast in place option. Um, so I do want to highlight the big number right here is if you utilize this method you're capped at a minimum of, of 12 inches um, that you have to achieve. Whereas the previous method, you could get a lot shallower in embeds. Um, we have minimums that we publish, um, but you're looking at you know, a minimum of three inches. Whereas for this particular methodology, you have to do 12 inches. Even if the forces that are prevalent, you know, it, even if you're only putting like 50 pounds of load, but you decide to design it that way, you gotta embed it 12 inches down. So there are, there are some equations, and they are lengthy, right? Um, it, it's not as bad as the, the other method, just because we're looking at all the equations right now. Um, so it's a little bit more straightforward. There's a lot of charts. Um, does Simpson provide these charts? No, these are actually charts that a lot of people to develop. Have you ever seen a, a set of rebar shock drawings? Uh, there's a good chance that these charts, this bar development length, is already put on there. And it kind of covers, you know, the wide range. What's your bar size, and then what kind of, uh, what's your concrete strength? Um, there's also, we have a web tool that will uh, essentially do the uh, same design. So there are a lot of options to, to quickly get that rebar development. All right, so the key takeaways is that 12 inches is, is the big one. Um, also, I point out, even though we have both set XP and set 3G approved for it, we only went through testing for at 2,500 PSI. So if the designer knows that they have stronger concrete, like 4,000 PSI concrete, um, they're still kind of they're kind of handicapped if they utilize that set XP. They're not going to be able to take a, uh, the benefit of that uh, added strength. Whereas set 3G was tested with those higher strengths, um, you're going to get a, a more accurate or cost cost efficient embedment. So there's a chance that you could uh, kind of shrink that embedment because of that testing. Applications, um, I said slab footing wall column extensions. When I say footing extensions, I'm talking about we're pouring, you know, you gotta pour 40 feet of uh, a strip footing and uh, for whatever reason the concrete uh, trucks only came, you can only get 20 feet. At that point you have to, um, if you didn't set any cast in place downs, you can come along for that longitude, that rebar that runs the length of it. You can come in and dowel and essentially use this kind of methodology to quickly figure out your number and, and dowel into it. Um, now, I don't think the common application is using this method to go to the top of the footing. Um, because like I said, remember that 12 inches? Uh, a lot of times, uh, continuous strip footing may be 12 inches, and that's a, that's, that's a no-no, essentially. You're drilling uh, all the way through our Footing right there. And like I said, only use it for rebar. All right, so real quick, let's run through the design example. It's not going to take that long, um, but it, it just kind of lays out a pretty uh, apparent fact here. So I chose this particular design example because it, it's kind of one of the reasons that um, this uh, whole class was uh, uh, occurring was to address this kind of common situation where we got uh, a strip footing and uh, a wall sitting on top of it. And I, I pulled the the, uh, the details straight out of the IRC, uh, specific to seismic uh, D0, D0, which is uh, this uh, particular area. And you can see here, 
The rebar that comes in and sticks out of the footing right there is that number four dab at 48 inches on center. So I said, you know, it's, it's mis mislocated or it's damaged. Um, so we got to come back and, and put a number four dab into the top of it. And we're just going to look real quick, what kind of design can we get out of the anchor theory and then what kind of design can we get out of the rebar development? Right? So just uh, some assumptions I made, 3,000 PSI, 60 KSI uh, steel, uh, footing dimension, 15 inches thick, 30 inches wide. First, the anchor design, uh, the theory, using the anchor design. Pretty quick, um, that 30 dimension right there is what you see. Uh, the cutoff kind of area, that's actually saying, hey, I got a continuous footing that runs 10 feet that way and 10 feet that way. That's just kind of how the image shows up right there. Uh, so I got the one down sticking right there. And the force that I designed to was essentially, I want to design the adhesive to be able to take, uh, to make sure my failure mechanism is that steel failure uh, mechanism associated with that. I want to make sure the rebar yields. And now actually technically, that 1350 for a number four bar, that's actually not the yielding strength of it. It's actually a little bit more. Um, so the, just the way the code is set up, you actually check the ultimate strength and then you apply that reduction factor. So that's why, that's why this number is actually a little bit higher than the yielding strength. Whereas the next example, we're trying to achieve the yielding strength of that rebar. So you can see uh, we got to where the steel was the failure mechanism and the concrete breakout and both the adhesive uh, were good. Anything less than one is good, it's in the green. Um, so we were able to get number six, or excuse me, number four rebar with eight inches of embedment. And going into a 15 inch footing, that's, that works, that's good. Jumping over, rebar development length provision. Uh, can anybody guess probably what the default number is? Wow. It's uh, 12. Oh, yeah. It was 12. I was playing with the numbers. That's a little bit of a trick right there. Um, so at the very minimum, I knew it was going to be 12 inches. Um, it turned out, based on the uh, concrete strength and based on the parameters that we set, we're getting a requirement of 13.10 inches. Uh, pretty exact right there. Obviously, you never uh, would put that on a set of drawings to round that number off. But 13.10 inches is a problem because that 15 inches would not provide adequate clear cover, right? Because anytime you're setting rebar and it's going to be exposed to a ground surface, you need at least three inches of clear cover in it. We're not even achieving that by drilling that hole. So that's a problem. Actually, for this particular application, that design methodology just, just wouldn't work. All right, so what about shear? You've been talking about tension this whole time. What about shear? So like I said, shear um, is a, you know, a load, basically a, a lateral load that gets pushed right there. Pretty common application for stem walls or, or walls is that if you have backfill going up, get up against that, that soil is going to get wet and then it's going to hydrostatic force or you're going to get flood. Um, you know, we're going to see flood forces associated on that wall. Um, you're going to get some hydrostatic uh, pressure associated with that. Um, so there's a very uh, real kind of definite low condition where on that dowel right there, you're going to see shear forces being transferred and being resisted. Basically, that dowel has to hold up that, uh, uh, resist that force. Um, so, within the acceptance criteria, do we ever test for shear? Uh, for the AC308, per the older anchor theory, yeah, we do. We test for seismic shear. Um, interesting enough, when you go back in and check the kind of weak link, the failure mode for shear, uh, you actually, ACI says uh, actually the, the adhesive is never even a possibility for uh, being a failure mode. Now, the reason we test this is we get a, a, a factor that goes into the design of the steel strength in seismic application. Um, so if you jump over to the rebar development link provision, you know, it within that kind of separate side list, of uh, testing criteria. Yeah, we don't test for shear, but we do test for shear in the, the same test that we have to run. Um, so uh, by default, if we have adhesive that is approved for that anchor theory, um, it's you know, approved and uh, acceptable for, for, uh, for shear applications. All right, so with that, I'll give everybody a quick break, and then we'll get into the, something more, much more uh, practical, just, uh, not as heavy in the engineering. Thank <laughs> you.
presentation should be a little bit more uh, interesting, if you will, uh, unless you uh, get into uh, the, the engineering details of it. This is, uh, uh, as, as Seth's right, says right here, proper adhesive anchor installation. Um, so we're going to get into uh, the actual uh, ins and outs of actually installing the, the anchor and, and making sure that um, you, know, you, you, you don't install a faulty product, um, which results in uh, problems down the line for, for you and everybody involved. So, you know, I could just end this uh, presentation right now and just say, hey, let's look at, which I think someone wants that, um, let's look at uh, the manufacturer printing installation instructions, um, which are available. Um, they're available online. Um, you can certainly, uh, got someone locked out over there. Um, <clears throat> they're available online. Um, they're in our, our, our evaluation reports. Um, additionally, you could go online. There's, there's online, uh, training uh, that, is, that is available. It's free through our software. Um, anybody can take it and essentially go through and, and uh, find out the proper way to install these. And, and at the end of that training, you basically get a printout that says, hey, you've been trained specific for Simpson Strong Tie adhesive manufacturing. Um, so, but, you know, obviously we're going to take a deeper dive and, and kind of go over the, the topics today. But I just want to point out, if, if you forget a lot of this today, it's available. It's on our website, strongtie.com. Um, it's, it. it's available through that training resource. All right, so what's the first step that you got to do? Uh, you got to drill the hole, right? Um, drill the hole, you got to make sure you've got the right drill bit, and then you got to clean out that hole. Um, so let's go into the little bit of details associated with that. And you can see, this is actually a pretty small drill bit that they got hooked up right there, but it's creating a, a, a lot of dust. So you create a lot of dust with this process. Um, I just want to point that out because dust is the enemy, like I, I say on one of the slides in a little bit future. You want to make sure you got the right drill bit. Um, so not all drill bits are created equal. Um, you want the appropriate drill bit. Um, for our adhesives, to achieve the bond strengths, to achieve the loads, the strength that we publicize and we have in our reports, you need a carbide tip drill bit. What you don't need is a core drill bit or a, a diamond core drill bit over there. Um, we specifically say what type of carbide drill bit, uh, ANSI B212.15. I point that out because at some places you can go and they may have a, a kind of a, a bargain bin of drill bits um, and if you, if you grab out of there, you might find that some of those drill bits aren't ANSI approved. Um, why is that an issue? Because ANSI essentially sets the tolerance. Uh, when we say that that's a half inch diameter drill bit, uh, we mean that it fits within a particular gauge of size, a particular diameter. Um, we've ran into the issue where we've gotten called out to the site and they're like, you know, uh, they're trying to install uh, one of our mechanical anchors. And they're like, hey, we, we drilled this, but we can't even get the, uh, the, the anchor into place. And it's like, well, let's take a look at your drill bit. Like, ah, well, that, that's because it says half inch on it, but when you pull the tape measure on it, it's, it's not. And, and that's because it was not an ANSI approved drill bit. So we want you to make sure that you get the proper drill bit. And we sell, we sell drill bits. We sell very high quality drill bits. Um, they're, they're German steel, um, which, you know, you think about the razor blades that uh, people get. That's always uh, advertised as a, uh, a good benefit. So they are, they are very quality drill bits, but we're not specific. We're not saying to, to install, uh, you know, our Set 3G product, you must have a Simpson uh, drill bit. You can use any drill bit provided they meet that pretty standard ANSI B12 um, requirement. Why, why do I say you can't use a core drill bit? Well, essentially, that core drill bit does a little too well of a job. And when it's drilling in place, it's going to cut that hole and it's going to leave that hole surface very, very smooth. Whereas the carbide drill bit is a little rough and there's going to be imperfections all along that surface of that hole. And what did I talk about at the start? How does that adhesive get its strength? It's, it's through somewhat of a mechanical interlock with that hole surface right there. So if it's too smooth, then things are going to get slick and you're going to use, lose strength with that. So. Uh, you don't want things to be slick. You want them to you know, stick nice together. Um, so there is, you know, I tell contractors, don't, don't worry, you know, 
Don't explore the, don't utilize a, a core drill bit. Now, if for some reason someone did do it, uh, unbeknownst to anyone in the crowd, and you got, you know, you real word that uh, utilize a core drill bit, we have done testing to look at that. Now, what happens is there's a reduction in strength. Um, that's not a, that's not a pass. That's just something to look at because there could still be the scenario where if the engineer um, says, okay, if we lost a reduction in strength, we could still make it work, but that's not always the case. It could certainly mean uh, the, uh, by reducing that strength, you've gone from good to bad, and you have to come up with some type of uh, you know, remediation um, uh, to be able to fix that particular anchor. What kind of kind of drill? Um, you need a, a hammer drill. I, I show this, and I'm, I'm sure every contractor is know what I talk what I talk about. But you want a hammered rotary drill, um, and you can see right here. If there's that toggle right there, you can jump between rotation only or hammer only. Um, we're going to be set it right in the middle there with the rotary hammer set. Um, so it's going to be beaten and then also uh, turning at the same time when you're making that hole. Use the correct drill bit size. Um, so, you know, we talked about the anti-V12, but you also want to make sure that you don't grab for a half-inch diameter anchor. You don't want to use uh, a one-and-a-quarter drill bit. You want the diameter anchor that we specify in our catalogs, in our reports, um, or if you call any of us up, we would be able to tell you what's the appropriate drill bit size. Um, so we show that right there. And, you know, I, I run into a lot of engineers that just say, oh, yeah, it's, a, it's an eighth-inch bigger. Um, that is, you know, if you run down here, you can see for that three quarters inch, yeah, it is eighth inch, seven eighths, seven eighths. Sometimes it's, it's not always true. Sometimes it's unique. For a threaded rod, for a half inch, it's actually a sixteenth inch bigger. So it's always just better to come back and check this and, and make sure you're working with it. That said, we have kind of looked at the situation because it happens all the time. Someone used the wrong drill bit and they want to know. How big of a mistake that I made? Am I still okay? So we we've, we've looked at that and we said, you know, based on these particular set range of a uh, of uh, oversized holes, um, you're still okay because we have a 1.0 reduction factor. Which in my mind, you multiply something by 1.0, you're not reducing it. It's the same number, so it's not really a reduction factor. But we we do have that. So that's something that you can actually keep in the in your back pocket if if you find that uh, someone's already uh, drilled out 20. 20 holes, but they fall into this range right there. Um, that's something that you can show. You know, you certainly want to make it known and, and correct the issue, but you can uh, at least point that um, for, for those holes that, that have already been formed. Okay, so dust is the enemy, right? So if you're baking a cake and you don't want the cake to sit in the pan, it's stuck in the pan, what are you going to do? You're going to put flour. You're going to put dust in the pan, right? Um, if you put dust in a hole, and you put the adhesive down in there, what's going to happen? It's not going to stick in the hole, right? I, you know, just earlier I heard a story where you know someone actually uh, pulled out a six-inch embedment with, you know, with their um, just uh, through their own strength essentially because there was uh, an incredible amount of dust left in that hole uh, when they put the adhesive in. And uh, I actually that's not the first time that I've heard that. I've heard that from a, a lot of people in the past that they uh, run into that issue. Um, if you leave dust in that hole it will significantly reduce that strength. It's not a question. It's, it's definitely going to happen. You're not going to get that advertised strength. And it's not just going to be like a small reduction. It's going to be big. It's going to go from the point of working to definitely not working. Hmm. All right. So proper hole cleaning procedures. There's essentially two available methods out there, what you'll find. Um, the more traditional method of drill, blow, brush blow, and then the newer method of vac vacuum dust extraction system. We'll kind of dive into uh, both of them, but if you know both of them, if done properly, you will achieve that, that bond strength that we advertise. <clears throat> so first, the drill, blow, brush blow. <clears throat> so you're going to drill the hole. You're going to come along with 80 psi. I apologize. Got wrong number. Okay. So 80 psi. 
So I showed that air compressor for, for a reason. You gotta you gotta hit that 80 bit side. You don't want you know the turkey baster or something like that there trying to, to blow out the holes or something like that. Um, it needs to have some pretty good air on associated with it. Four cycles of the stroke of the brush. We manufacture brushes. Um, brushes come in all different sizes, different lengths, or the, the different hole depths or diameter anchors. So you want to get the appropriate brush for the appropriate hole. Uh, four cycles. I always say, what is a cycle? You know, what is one push up? Is it halfway down? You don't do one, two, you do down, up, one, right? So that's essentially what a cycle is down, up, one. And then come back. What, what you've done with the brush is kind of you loosen things up. You create, you got more dust that fell to the bottom of the hole again, so you want to come back and just hit that last bit of dust. After that, your hole's pretty clean. Now, if you did the, the Butler white glove test and uh, um, uh, check that hole, you'd still find some dust on it. But it's sufficient enough and it matches the same type of procedure that we do in the lab when we're, when we're going through our testing um, to show that we can get those uh, particular strengths. Now, it's significantly cleaner uh, than where you were at the start. Alternatively, now this is where I want to be. I'm not an OSHA expert <clears throat> by any means, but I, I do know that you know OSHA has their silica fume dust requirements. Um, it, it, you want to be careful with uh, exposure uh, for anybody getting exposed to these uh, kind of small dust molecules that fly in the air and make sure they don't swallow it in their lungs there um, or breathe it in their lungs and, and have issues down the road. So, keeping uh, uh, one particular method um, that is uh, along those lines is uh, essentially utilizing this uh, vacuum dust extraction drill bit. What you see right here, it's the drill bit. It's a carbide tip drill bit, but right there at the, at the head right there, there's actually flutes um, that, that open up, and uh, that's, a, that's a hollowed kind of rifle barrel uh, drill bit. And essentially, it hooks up to that HEPA back, which you know, looks like a souped up shop back, sucks the dust out, um, rotates, and, and basically as it's uh, drilling that hole, the dust is getting sucked directly in that drill bit and running out that vacuum, clean out the hole. Now, do you have to come back and do the blow brush blow method? No, the hole is, is sufficiently cleaned at that point, and it would meet our, um, meet our um, published bond strength values. Um, additionally, do you need, you know, it, for anybody that's familiar, we did have a partnership with uh, Bosch. We don't anymore. Do you need a, a Bosch vacuum and a uh, Bosch approved vacuum drill bit? Um, no, because we've gone through and we, we've tested other vacuum, uh, other hollow, hollow drill bits uh, for these applications. So um, you just want to make sure that it meets the requirement of a standard, I think, uh, Zach, do you know that it's the 80 PSI suction? Right, or, uh, they do it by um, CF, AEC, so that would be 127, it's basically talking about how much dust is extracted per second. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's got to get meet that minimum standard, yeah. essentially. All right, additionally, I'm sure some of you have seen this in distributors or, or stores right there. Um, does a dust collector attachment clean my hole? because um, it, it can significantly reduce the dust in the air, it does not clean the hole. Um, you still have to come back. If, if you utilize one of these uh, dust collector tools, you still got to come back with the blow brush blow method because there's still going to be a considerable amount of dust in there uh, in that particular hole, but it's going to keep things a, a, a lot cleaner you know, um, and uh, significantly reduce that dust in the work environment. All right, so after you drill the hole and you cleaned it out, you're gonna start prepping that cartridge, right? The, the adhesive cartridge. What's the first thing you do? You wanna make sure that you're not using an expired adhesive. And we, we print these numbers, these expiration dates, just like on your milk carton. Um, we put them on each one of our cartridge right there. Um, typically, if you get a brand new one, there's gonna be a, a two year shelf life associated with it. Um, so, what this does, it ensures that, you know, after two years, we get a little 
uh, unsure uh, just how this product was stored and its ability to essentially maintain its chemical makeup after that long of a time, given you know we could be sitting in a, a, a hot box for the past two years. So um, you know we, we just there's too many unknowns and variables. So that at that point we just kind of have to um, call it. You know, essentially, if you got anything that's past that expiration date, you better go get an, another another cartridge because Simpson Strong Type will not stand um, staying behind it. Two, open your cartridge. So there's kind of a variety of different ways. Um, just depends. You, you, you just, uh, it, it's almost self-explanatory. Once you have it in, in your hand and, and looking at it, you know you can screw the top off. It's kind of like a twist, uh, twist break. Um, the set 3G right over here. You actually cut it. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to cut. So it's just a variety of different methods to uh, open it up. Um, but it's something to be aware of. Step three, attach the nozzle and don't mix and match. Why do we say don't mix and match? Because as I was talking, you know, the, the epoxy set for G, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. The nozzle is different compared to the ATXP, which is a 10-to-one ratio. It's got a different nozzle. You can see that in the picture right there. Um, you can see the different colors associated with it. Now, also, I'll show the set 3G, it comes with the nozzle. Also, one thing, I, I took off the SRAM wrap. All of our cartridges now come in SRAM wrap, wrapped up with the nozzle. So it's, it's pretty hard to uh, lose that nozzle because it's in a nice little package for you. Um, now I lost, I took the SRAM wrap off this one and clearly lost the nozzle. So don't take the SRAM wrap off until you're ready to. Um, I'll also point out, you know, if you unscrew this HEX boot, And we try to take the nozzle for set 3G. It's got different thread patterns. It won't fit. So we we purposely try to eliminate an error like that. It's, it's just not threading right. It's not screwing down. So if it doesn't thread right, that should be a key indication. You got the wrong nozzle for the for the uh, particular adhesive. Don't try to duct tape it. We've definitely seen that. Um, we've seen creative solutions. Um, you can't, you know, I'm sure someone can figure out a way to get adhesive into that nozzle. It's just not, not going to mix it properly. All right. <laughs> Insert the cartridge into the dispensing tool. You want a quality dispensing tool. Um, we make quality dispensing tools. There's other manufacturers out there that like quality dispensing tools. Um, what you don't want, you know, you're looking at this smaller dispensing tool. It looks, you know, it looks like a souped up caulking gun right there. You don't want to use the caulking gun. Um, it, it's, you're not going to get a very uniform uh, pump uh, associated with it. It's also going to wear out um, whoever's having to uh, dispense this uh, uh, adhesive. It's going to wear out their forearms. They're going to be looking like Popeye by the end of the day. Um, you're going to be pumping. The, uh, the, the, uh, the gauge just is, is totally different. It's going to pay off if you get quality dispensing tool. Additionally, if, if you're having to do a lot of holes, um, we do have a pneumatic dispensing tool and also a battery operated dispensing tool. But you know, for a lot of applications, if, if you're talking residential, even commercial, you can get away with um, this particular one just because that, that action on that is, is pretty, it's pretty easy and it, uh, it doesn't take a lot of effort uh, to go dispense a lot of adhesive. Any questions or anything? I think we're flowing here pretty good. All right, so make sure, basically you want to, uh, you know, you could do this with the nozzle on or without, but you just want to make sure that you have the two components, the A and the B, the resin and the hardener, flowing properly. Um, you know, a colleague of mine likes to do it without the nozzle because you can very quickly see the two colors associated right there, and if you, uh, you know, you take this and dispense it off to the side somewhere, you can quickly see the uh, uh, two contrast of the color, therefore you know that the two products are, uh, are, are engaged and, and coming out properly. Uh, you can do the same deal with the mixing nozzle right there. You just want to set it to the side there, 
And you'll notice as you go through there and run that line, which I think I got, it's one of my videos. Um, as you run that line right there, you'll kind of notice um, a, a color different um, differentiation um, occurring at the start to the end. All right, so as we were just about to put the adhesive down in the hole, let's take a little bit deeper dive into the difference between an epoxy base and an acrylic base. Now, I kind of said at the start there, what is an acrylic base? It's more like a fast curing uh, adhesive compared to the epoxy. Um, but uh, really, let's go a little bit deeper um, associated with that. Um, the big difference, um, when I say fast curing, the big difference is between the gel time and the cure time. And that gel, obviously that's not adhesive gel, that's just a gel. I kind of want to um, explain the gel uh, kind of viscosity uh, that I'm referencing there. Um, essentially, uh, for both the epoxies and the acrylics, we have a published gel time. And that published gel time is based on the temperature of the base substrate. When I say substrate, I'm talking about the concrete, or I'm talking about the CMU. I'm not talking about the, the temperature in the air, or what the weatherman uh, was saying. It's temperature of the actual uh, material. Um, cure time. That's the time it takes for the adhesive to, um, it, it's, it's already hardened because that gel time is the amount of time it goes from that gel state to the hardened state, but that's the amount of time it takes to get to its structural, uh, fully structural load. Um, so you have two different uh, times associated with that. So what's the biggest uh, kind of factor in affecting those cure times? In those gel times is the the temperature right there. So if it's if it's hot, it's going to speed things up. If it's cold, it's going to slow things down. Um, your best bet to figure that out is just get one of these uh, relatively cheap uh, temperature radars and just hit that particular piece up um, because you could be working one side of the building that never gets exposed to sun and you know maybe it's uh, only March, but you know it, it's been a cold snap and if it never gets exposed to that sun, that that, that concrete can hold uh, uh, that kind of cool temperature for quite a while and could, could affect um, how long it takes for you to be able to, to load those uh, anchors up. All right, so the difference between the two, set 3G, it's a good hot weather, right? It's kind of like your three seasons uh, type of adhesive, whereas ATXP, um, it, it's better in the cold weather. And you can see right here, so, you know, we did have a, Kind of cooled off this week, but uh, leading into this, things were pretty hot. If your concrete temperature was at 100 degrees, your gel time is going to be 15 minutes with set 3G, and the cure time is 24 hours. So you could set those anchors, and then a day later come back, and they're they're good to go. They're ready to be loaded. Um, this is outside of the 21 21 uh, day uh, concrete cure time that we're talking about. Um, the cure schedule for the ATXB, you can see things get Pretty quick, gel time in one minute, cure time in 20 minutes. So if you're able to actually put the adhesive, dispense the adhesive, and immediately put your th uh, thread rod or rebar down the hole right there and not have it hard enough before you can actually physically get that piece in, uh, you could come back 20 minutes later and actually load it up uh, to its full capacity, um, which is pretty impressive. Now that gets, that's pretty tricky, right? On any summer days or, or uh, you know, even warmer spring and fall days, using ATXP, you better have your ducks in a row because um, you're going to go through, if you don't, uh, you're going to mess up and you're going to end up with a hardened uh, adhesive down the hole without any type of a, a dowel going into it and you're going to end up with a, a lot of just uh, adhesive that you end up wasting. So it's, it's going to be a costly mistake um, for yourself as a contractor. Now if things are cold, that's where you want to start to think about the acrylic. If it's down in the 50 degree temperature base, you know, it's still it's still a working time, right? Seven minutes, um, that's still going to work for you. Three hours cure time. Whereas the epoxy, it's going to take forever to start to uh, cure and harden. 75 minutes, 72, what's that? Five days? No, three days. Um, that's, a, that's a good good amount of time. Even, even down that 40 degree mark right there, it's going to take two weeks for it to reach full strength. So that's why you want to think about the, you know, what is the base temperature substrate, and then choose your uh, uh, adhesive appropriately. All right, so epoxies, long gel time, long cure time. Good for three seasons, 
summer. It's also, notice we use orange for that, but blue for the acrylic. Short cure time, short, short gel time for acrylics. And also, I'll point out, you know, I kind of hammered on the subject earlier. For those two, if for some reason you did come across an engineer and they actually told you, hey, that rebar to Bowman link provision, that's the one I used, and I need set 3G, you can't go and, and flip it on with ATX because it's just not approved for that rebar to Bowman link provision. All right, so the difference between set 3G and set XP, so that, that was a question I got a little bit earlier, um, you know, they do have a lot of similar, uh, similar uh, approvals uh, when it comes to, uh, to concrete. Um, but you will see, so 3G is our newer formula, right? So it's, it's better, it's more improved. We, we've uh, uh, you know, built upon the technology that we know so far. We're able to come out with a better product. And you can see that with the bond strength values. It's significant difference uh, between the bond strength values right there. Um, so a lot of times, you know, for a three quarters of an inch diameter anchor, uh, you can see that's almost three times the available bond strength uh, for set 3G compared to the XP. Now, I'll mention it because I mentioned it earlier. Set XP is approved for CMU, whereas set 3G is not. Uh, that's something to take into consideration. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to minimize issues and you know that you are going to be down into uh, embedding into CMU on the same job that you're doing concrete, uh, then you, you need to think about that if you got 3G for concrete, but XP for CMU, you definitely don't want to switch that um, application around. All right. Another benefit of set 3G, it's good for more hole conditions. Now, preferably, every time you do this, and, and likely called out in the engineering drawings, they call out that you utilize a, a dry concrete uh, hole condition. Um, that, that will achieve the highest bond strength values. Um, that's just your, your best situation. Now we have gone through, we've tested, and looked at what happens when you've got a water saturated concrete hole. So what that what does that mean? Water saturated is that it rains, but um, you know things have dried up, and you don't have a standing puddle down in that hole. Um, but if, if you were to you know uh, touch that concrete surface, you would definitely feel some dampness to it. That's what water saturated is. Water filled. It rained an hour ago, and all those holes that you drilled, and then we're going to come back on. And, and uh, put adhesive down in, they're all filled up with water. Um, so you got standing water in place. That's where, if, if you had that condition, you could utilize set 3G. Now there's a, a slight bond reduction associated with that, so that's something you need to uh, you know, clear with your engineer. Um, be like, hey, the construction is, it, is what it is, can we get away with uh, utilizing water-filled holes? Also, submerged concrete, what is that? If you're doing a marine project and you're five feet underwater and you, you, know, you got the dive tanks on, that's a submerged concrete uh, condition. Whereas jumping over here, set XP, only proof for that dry concrete and water saturated. So you can't have any standing water down in that hole. All right, so back to the installation. So we, we picked the right adhesive that we want and we've cleaned the hole and we've prepped the cartridge. And then it's just a matter of um, and filling the, uh, the hole there. Turn that. So essentially what you want to do is fill that hole from half to two-thirds full. The reason you want to do that is because once you put that rod or rebar back into place, if you fill it too high, obviously the material is going to be spilling out. One, that's just wasted material if, if you're the contractor and you don't want to buy uh, any more cartridges because um, you're ending up with half the adhesive uh, popping out of the hole. But two, let's say if this is a seal plate application and you're coming back and, and you're going to put Two by six or two by four, right on top there. Um, you got this, uh, um, all this uh, hardened uh, adhesive sitting out on top of it, making for the install a little bit uh, more difficult. Likewise, if you're setting uh, uh, any type of uh, steel um, base structure to it, um, you, you certainly don't want that um, adhesive in in the way there affecting your uh, install. So, essentially, you know, we recommend. Fill the whole half to two thirds full, and then insert it. Um, and then, you know, obviously, if you got ten in a row, you're going to get uh, pretty good at knowing uh, just how deep uh, to do that infill. One thing that I, you know, I'll have to get with our marketing crew is that when they showed that uh, uh, thread rod getting put in place, 
they were just putting down straight in place. If you look over in instructions here, we, t we twist it. Um, we recommend that you kind of rotate it. Doesn't matter if it be clockwise or counterclockwise, we just recommend that you kind of rotate it as you've been putting it in place. Okay, so what happens if you have an overhead application? Uh, probably not too, uh, too um, frequent in the residential world, but definitely in the commercial world. Um, for overhead applications or a horizontal application, or even if for some reason you got a 24 inch in bed, um, you got to think there's limitations with just how long this nozzle is, right? So what about the deeper holes um, where you can't actually fit that nozzle into place? Um, what we have here is the piston plug system, and it's not, you know, technology, this technology isn't groundbreaking. It's a plastic tube, right? It's a plastic tube that you can cut to length, um, and it's fitted with these piston plugs, which are just um, these uh, plugs at the end of the tube that are specifically sized appropriate for your diameter of your hole. And then you can run that piston plug uh, all the way down in that hole. And then you're utilizing hydrostatic pressure of just that adhesive getting filled in the hole to, to push it out. And what that does, especially for overhead applications, you get a nice, consistent, void-free, hole-free uh, infill of that adhesive in there. Whereas if I had this uh, nozzle and I was just trying to gauge it uh, by pulling it out, there's a good chance that I'd leave a, a couple voids in there as I, as I go through because I'm just uh, kind of eyeballing it. Whereas if you're going down, you got gravity working for you, right? Uh, if you infill a hole, uh, gravity's helping you out and, and eliminating those voids as, you, as you're going along there. So, um, another video which this guy doesn't install properly. So you can see where we got the piston plug, you know, put it on the end of the, the plug there, cut it to length. Make sure you got obviously uh, additional supply there to set it in the hole. Um, he's going to put it into place there. Like I said, it's just hydrostatic pressure that pushes that out. You, mean, you get a nice consistent fill. Now for overhead and horizontal applications, we require this. And you can see he actually, so that's just a little um, uh, plug at the end there. It's, it's cut out in the middle to allow for that rebar or, or threaded rod, but you can see he's turning it. Um, so he did the proper install right there. All right, so what about, so we've talked about concrete a lot, but there's a lot of applications where you have to, uh, you know, uh, provide an anchor into CMU. Um, what do you do there? Um, basically, you're going to utilize a screen. We have plastic and we have steel screens, the OptiMesh uh, plastic screen and, and steel screen. Um, so I'll show you this video real quick that does a good job of install for a hollow CMU. So at first, you actually, before that screen has been put in place, you put the adhesive down into it. You fill it all the way to the top too. Then you cap it off, and he's gonna, the person's gonna come, put it into place. And then at that point, you're gonna come back with the thread rod, put that in, and you can see there, you're gonna have all that adhesive that kind of leaks out through all those voids in the screen right there. And also notice, if you were to hold one of these in your hand, you notice the, the void pattern at the, at the collar, closer to the, to the joint right there. It's a little bit more open, more freer. And that's what you get. You get a, a kind of this glob of adhesive right there. And that kind of fit, uh, creates this collar, if you will, at the back of the, uh, the seam of your wall uh, to provide that resistance. And what is the screen doing? It's making sure that you're just not pumping endless amounts of uh, adhesive down in there, a hollow block. All right, any other questions about adhesive? Proper adhesive install. Um, so after that, yeah, you're uh, you're good to go. So I'll, I'll jump over to uh, my colleague with a question. Yeah, Chris, this is Zach. Hey, um, I know in the past that when you were installing adhesive horizontally or vertically, you had to have special training or licensing. Do you know if that's still the case? I believe that's no. Well, okay. For you need uh, continuous special inspection to occur. So that's horizontal, per the building code, per the IBC, you need to continue with special inspections. So you need that special inspector out on site, uh, similar as it's laid out earlier, um, just uh, observing that, that install. Because that install is just, it's trickier, right? Anything overhead is just trickier. Um, 
So that is that is the requirement associated with that. Also the requirement utilizing that piston plug. Installer to be certified, yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean at that point, like I said, with our with uh, with our uh, uh, website training, uh, it's very quick and easy to get uh, certified uh, installer. But manufacturer specific. We're, what we're not talking about, there's another ACI specific training. That is definitely much lengthier um, and it covers uh, a lot of different manufacturers associated with that. That is not what we're specifically addressing. Uh, I'm talking about manufacturer specific training. Ah, okay, so with that, and we got about 15 minutes, so I, th I think we can cover these. So I just want to hit on a quick topic of mechanical anchors because we just talked about adhesive anchors this whole time. But mechanical anchors definitely have a uh, uh, kind of a, a place in the game there. Um, but two, you know. If you were to open any anchor catalog up, you'd see a wide variety of different um, mechanical anchors out there. But I would say for structural applications, the most two most common, uh, most commonly used, uh, specified or designed is your screw anchor, your Titan HD screw anchor, and then a wedge anchor. So this is the Strong Bolt 2, or expansion anchor is what they also are called. So the Titan HD screw anchor, this is my personal favorite product of mine if I I had a favorite, um, just because the kind of wide range of applications, also the fast and easy install associated with it. You, so you can see, you can utilize it for concrete, ground field CMU, and also hollow CMU. Um, a lot of applications, and once again, right there, what are we doing? We're putting in the middle of the seal plate, so can you guess what the minimum edge distance is? It's an inch and three quarters, uh, similar to adhesive anchors. Okay, the install process. So we spent about 40 minutes talking about the install process with adhesives. Uh, we can do the screw anchor in about 40 seconds. So you drill the hole, you clean out the hole. Now, the reason you're cleaning out the hole is because you don't want three inches of dust sitting at the bottom of your hole. And then you go to install that anchor and you go and you hit up against that, that dust piled up right there and you can't get your anchor all the way in place. It's not so much you're cleaning out the hole because uh, some friction factor or anything like that, uh, you're blowing the dust out so you just don't have this pile of dust sitting down in place. After that, you come and come back um, with your impact wrench and just drive that piece into place. Now, talking about drill bit, we still want that carbide drill bit, but the drill bit size, if you're installing a half inch diameter Titan HD, you're using a half inch diameter drill bit. Um, it's the same one for one right there. Um, that's because the uh, strength of a screw anchor is derived essentially from those threads, those first inertial threads, or cutting threads, and they cut grooves into the side of the concrete right there for the remainder of the threads to kind of sit in and, and interlock and get that mechanical, mechanical lock between the two. And that's, that's it, that's the install of it. Um, it's uh, more reliable, if you will. Um, there's less, uh, there is less steps associated with it. I always, I always think, uh, you know, um, I, I hear uh, electric, uh, electric cars, and I hear that they just have less pieces to break in them. That's kind of a similar concept with Titan HD. There's just less pieces, uh, less things that could go wrong associated with them. So, especially our overhead applications, uh, I would definitely look at that as, a, as opposed to utilizing that, that piston plug system. All right, and uh, some other benefits. There's a lot of variety to them. Um, we got them in stainless steel grades, um, both in type 304, 316, 3016. If it was going outside here, right against the beach, it's got to be 316. Um, that's, a, that's for your most corrosive, aggressive environment. Um, there's a lot of different uh, head styles. Uh, we got the countersunk head style. Um, that's also available in carbon steel, but also in that stainless steel option. Um, we got the rod coupler if, if you're running thread rod that's part of the, the building's lateral system all the way down. You can utilize that rod coupler. And then we have the washer head. Now I got a couple samples of the washer head back over there. Um, I will say, you know, uh, it, at first when I saw that, I was like, oh great, we can eliminate um, essentially the, that heavy duty washer right there. Unfortunately, that washer head is not big enough to eliminate that, that washer. So uh, would I use it a lot around here? Um, no, because if you have to uh, put that washer head, you kind of lose the benefit of having that, that 
that flush head associated with it, but there could be applications that come up uh, associated with it. Just not so much around. So the stainless steel anchor, kind of interesting part of it. So the body and all those top threads are all stainless steel. But those first couple of cutting threads right there that you see, they're actually carbon steel because stainless steel actually, you know, in comparison to other steels right there, it's kind of a soft material. And we needed something a little bit thicker, uh, a little bit, a little bit harder to be able to cut into that concrete. Um, so we were able to uh, braze or weld those stainless steel threads to the, to the or excuse me, carbon steel threads uh, to that stainless steel anchor. Expansion anchors. So the strength is derived with that clip down at the base right there. Um, you're going to tighten once you uh, get this. Expansion anchor down into place, you, you, you beat it with a hammer to get it down into place. You're going to tighten it to a specified torque, and essentially it's going to pull up on that clip right there, and that clip's going to kind of cut and engage into the concrete. And you get all your strength, your pull out strength, derived from that clip down at the base right there. Now, the installation process it's a couple more steps associated with it. Uh, you're drilling, you're cleaning the hole. Again, just to remove that two to three inches of uh, dust setting down in place. You're using a hammer to set it into place. It takes a little bit additional time compared to that Titan HD. And then, per our instructions, you should be using a torque wrench. Um, now, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get on anybody, but we've come across a lot of construction sites and not seen a torque wrench you know, anywhere on the site. Um, so, a lot of these expansion anchors are just getting. Uh, installed with just uh, what feels right as far as anchoring it down. Um, the big issue with that is one, you could under torque it, and then you're not really engaging that clip like you should be, and then you're not uh, essentially you're not installing that anchor to achieve the loads that um, it specifically was designed, or you could over torque it, and then you could damage that clip, and then all those loads go out the window. And you may not know that you got a completely faulty anchor down into place. So there's a couple more um, opportunities for, for a failure, or not a failure, but a, uh, a uh, mix-up associated with those anchors. All right, also edge distance. Like I said, the screw anchors and the adhesive anchors, they, they perform very well when you get close to the edge and that you can actually get them close to the edge. For the expansion anchors, you can't get them close to the edge. Um, it, it's upwards of four and a half inches um, minimum edge distance. So if you're using this expansion anchor on a seal plate that's right on along the edge right there, you're encroaching past that um, uh, uh, minimum that we set, and that is uh, installed incorrectly. Uh, what could occur is if you tighten it uh, to the appropriate torque, you might just get a blowout during the installation process on the side of the concrete. So with that, I always, anytime an engineer approaches me, I'm always recommending either the adhesive anchor, if they require the strength associated with it, or the screw anchor, um, which doesn't provide as high values as that adhesive anchors, um, but typically, if you're comparing the two between the screw anchor and the expansion anchor, the screw anchor will uh, provide a better solution in my eyes. All right, so let's save the last slides of that slide for the best right here. So this is what we have. So a common question, how soon can we install a post-installed anchor? Um, so I, I did, you know, I apologize for not speaking up because I, I, I kind of got myself um, crossed. Now, uh, when I saw the 28 days, um, I thought it was 21, but I wanted to, I, I didn't have it right in front of me, so I wanted to be sure. So ACI 318 within that, they specify 21 days. Um, we, I, checked just before this presentation. I couldn't find it in our evaluation code, but we do specify in our catalog um, that we recommend 21 days for a huge bank. But we have done testing um, to look at the condition where, you know, concrete is poured, you want to be able to put that anchor in and then start building that seam new wall um, right away. We have looked at that condition. Um, essentially, for our adhesives, we uh, will stand behind, essentially, uh, installing those adhesives all the way down to concrete that's only seven days old. So the point of being poured to seven days, provided, 
provided that when the concrete, when the anchor is loaded, when that rebar is, is uh, you know, uh, has tension uh, being applied to, that's a, a minimum of 21 days concrete strength. Is that, am I, did I kind of fumble on, on that? Does that make sense? So you can come in, uh, at least per our recommendations, install the adhesive anchor at that seven day mark, um, provided that the anchor is not loaded until that 21 day mark. Um, so for a CMU stem wall, unless you were gonna put backfill on it within that 21 days, um, our recommendations are that you could do that. Now, this isn't in the evaluation report and the ultimate answer lies in your local building official. So I wanna be specific in, in how I lay out this information. So. You can do it in seven days. That's the, that's the biggest thing though, is that you guys are kind of proven there. I mean, you're recommending something, you know, that you guys all share that information. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, we didn't discuss this beforehand, and you know, this would be a great discussion for afterwards. So uh, it's just the question was asked, and uh, so, um, so Bruce didn't know I had this slide in here, so he, he didn't see my slides before. So um, now mechanical anchors are a little bit different, and mechanical anchors are a little tricky, in my opinion. Um, so we we have this that says. Basically, you can install it at seven days, but whatever strength that concrete is at, that's the strength of the anchor for life. So if the designer thought that they were installing, that they were going to get 4,000 PSI, but you install it at seven days and it's only got 2,500 PSI, that anchor is not as strong as what the engineer thought. Um, so that one is a little bit trickier, and I would definitely, I would, anytime something's trickier, you want to make sure all parties are, uh, you know, aware of it uh, and in agreement um, before doing that. If you try to get the concrete, it would be easier. Because that sets it from the 4,000 PCI. But if you use it the 4,000 PCI, you can do it shorter time. That, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yes, that yeah. argument. So if you're using a higher strength concrete, that's going to ultimately get a higher strength than what is... Right. Called out, you that is a possibility. I would definitely. You need to have so if it doesn't pass PCI, mm -hmm. well, you could load it. Yeah, technically, yeah, you're absolutely right. Technically, uh, if if you're following on that, and you have the and you have the the break that supports that you you uh, when you installed that anchor, it was at set X strength. So yeah, but I would I would just make sure everybody's on the same you know in agreement before right. doing it. So. Any other quick, any questions or, or thoughts on that one? Okay, so once again, if you need, if you have any questions on insulation, um, you can you can actually look at our cartridges on the larger one. You can peel back that label, and you're going to see step by step guidance associated with it. You can look in our catalogs. You can look online. Um, you can dial this number, uh, one eight hundred number. You're going to get a person, and you're going to get it very quickly. Uh, essentially, from the moment it rings, there will be actually a live human that picks it up from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock, uh, your local time. Um, and then from there, they'll either be able to address your question right away, or they're going to route it to the local person, which is going to be Chris and Chris show. Um, so, you know, we get Chris, our cards are back there. If you if you want to skip that and just go directly to us, we always welcome any type of uh, any type of questions or concerns. Um, we're, we're always happy to help. With that, that's my last slide right there. I was just highlighting uh, some of the products that we covered: uh, Set 3G, ATXP, Titan HD, and Stronghold 2. Um, any other questions? Oh, it's right at two o'clock. So. Hey Chris, can I have just a couple things? Yes. Will you go back to the Titan HD installation page, please? Yes. Uh, one thing you want to be aware of when installing the Titan HD, uh, as Chris said, you do want to make sure you blow out the hole. 
But as you're drilling the hole, if you're looking for six inch embedment, you want to actually drill an extra half inch to three quarters of an inch. And the reason you want to do that is because as those teeth are cutting into the concrete, that dust is going to settle to the bottom of the hole. So if you don't drill it just over uh, a little bit deeper, then that dust can settle and cause the same issue as if you didn't blow the hole at all. Yeah, excellent point. And then go back to the SET3G installation page as well. One of the advantages of SET3G is, as Chris was saying with most of our adhesives, you have to do a cycle of four seconds blow, four cycles of brush, and then four seconds to blow. With the SET3G, if you use a steel wire brush, you cut that in half. So you can blow it for two seconds, brush two cycles, and then blow for two seconds as well. Another excellent point. Yes. So I had the 444 because I knew we had ATXP and ZXP in this presentation. I didn't want to see, I didn't want to, someone to see the two and think that's uh, applicable to all of them. But Zach's absolutely right. That's one of the benefits of SET3G is that it's just quicker. It's 222 as opposed to 444. With a steel brush, with the appropriate brush. 